Chaz Henry, and I'm the founder of PowerChalk.com. Today I'm joined for 30 minutes by hockey coach Jeremy Weiss. Jeremy, are you with us? I'm with you. Coaches, Jeremy is from Toronto where he won the AAA Ontario Championship, uh, no small feat if you know Canada hockey. Uh, he moved to Utah early enough in his high school career to become the all-time Utah high school goals and points leader. Uh, more importantly than those accomplishments, he led his high school team to a state championship. Jeremy, I understand your records are still intact. Uh, that's what I understand, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations on that. Uh, folks, Jeremy still coaches. He runs camps, and I'm popping up a link to his website, weisstechhockey.com slash blog. He, Jeremy's an active blogger. You can find his website there. There you're going to find a lot of drills, breakdowns, tools, and more. Uh, if you're coaching hockey, I highly suggest you, you give, give that a look. And so, so I met Jeremy through Power Chalk, and what I saw, as you probably know, we, we've got a lot of baseball, softball, golf on the Power Chalk site. I saw Jeremy doing stride analysis, so I reached out, uh, contacted Jeremy to find out exactly what he's doing with Power Chalk. Uh, Jeremy, how long have you been using video? Uh, I've been using video for, for a number of years now. Um, actually, I, in college, I was an exercise science major, and uh, so, you know, in some of my classes, especially, you know, the biomechanics class, we, um, you know, we did a lot of video work, and at the time, it was when um, you know video was just starting to be able to brought, be brought out to the masses. Now, by masses, I mean most of the colleges had access to it. Um, licensing, because the, the video programming we were using was, I, I thought, was amazing at the time. Um, it's it's actually nothing compared to what PowerShot's doing nowadays. But it was about twenty thousand um, dollars for a license. I looked into it because I thought it could be really cool to apply to you know some of the players I was working with. Um, you know, so as far as that goes, um, you know, I've been doing stride analysis probably for about I'd say probably about the last 10 years. Um, you know, if you if you include my kind of my college career in there as well, um, but it hasn't been until just recently where I stumbled across Power Chalk that it actually was you know in a format that was doable, that made sense, um, and was affordable. You know, for you know for your kind of everyday Joe to be able to use it. So you know, I got to give you kudos on that um, for putting out a fantastic product that's uh, very usable and uh, and very affordable for you know for your average hockey coach. Well, and that's, that's really the goal. I appreciate you saying that. That's really been the goal for us is, is to bring it to the masses, to bring it to, to these kids. And, you know, we've had coaches or parents ask us, you know, is it too early to start with video analysis? And our, our answer to that is, you know, how late do you want to get good form? I mean, the sooner you get good form and start practicing good mechanics, you know, the better your whole career goes. So, so we switched over to your screen. Tell us, tell us what you've got here. All right, so I sent out a little uh, a little notice on uh, on Facebook, just saying, hey, you know, I'm about to be doing this uh, this webinar with Power Chalk, and anybody who wants to stride analysis, send me your videos. So this is Ethan. Um, he's out in Ontario, Canada. He's a nine year old, and uh, what we did was uh, we went ahead and his his old man sent us sent us some footage, and and I figured it would be an awesome you know kind of real life example of what we could uh, how we could use Power Chalk in kind of our everyday everyday life. Um, and so this is actually, you know, one of the other cool benefits of, of technology these days is, you know, here I am, I'm down in Salt Lake City, and uh, I'm going to be able to, uh, you know, to, in live action, analyze this player who's, uh, who's out in Ontario. So it's kind of I'm, I'm, uh, neat. I'm a bad C-League goalie, so he looks pretty good to me. What do you see? <laughs> well, what I'm looking at, and, you know, I guess kind of before we get into the whole analysis, um, you know, anytime, you know, and, and this goes back to kind of my college career, but... Um, you know, one of the main things we learned was, uh, you know, is what makes up speed. And in my biomechanics class, we, you know, we, we broke down kind of the basic equation of, of where speed comes from. Now, they were applying it to running, so hockey will be a little bit different. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But, um, you know, running speed is, is a combination of, of stride length and stride frequency. So if you can improve on one of those two aspects without uh, you know, without going down in the other aspect, you know, so if you can improve your stride length without, without going less on your stride frequency, then you'll get faster. Or if you can improve your stride frequency without lowering your stride length, then you'll get faster. And so it's a combination of those two. Now when we move over to hockey, hockey is a little bit more complex than just running. Um, it's more, there's more to it than just how long your stride is. Uh, we're talking more stride distance, and by stride distance I mean how far are you going with each stride? So if I just took one stride, pushed, 
how far would that go before I stopped, right? Um, so it's, it's more of a question, stripe distance, or I call it efficiency, because there's so many different factors that go into it. And then obviously stripe frequency plays into it as well. So if I can keep an efficient stride and increase my stride frequency, then I'll get faster. Or the other way around, if I can keep my stride frequency and uh, you know get a lot more efficient, again, I'll go faster. Or best case scenario is you improve both of them, right? And then and then your speed will drastically enhance. Right. So usually when I'm when I'm running a camp, the very first thing I'm looking at is efficiency. You know, is my stride looking efficient? Because I can have the quickest feet in the world, but if I'm pushing straight back, for example, you know, I could be going a million miles an hour with my leg, and I could be moving, you know, an inch at a time on the ice because I'm not getting the efficient stride. So from there, usually what I do is I break down, and just this is kind of what I go through with my players and work with them. But um, you know, stride distance is going to be a combination of three things: your knee bend, or sorry, your stride efficiency is going to be a combination of three things: your knee bend, um, the angle that you're pushing off with each stride. And then your recoil, you know, so how far back you bring your foot each time, so you can again maximize the next stride. So that's what we're looking for in this, uh, you know, in this with with this example with this uh, this youngster here. Well, you, you know, can, you raise a, raise a couple good points there because number one, you really got to bite the ice. You you can't go straight back. You've got to bite the ice to get any kind of leverage against the ice. And then the other, I never really thought about that in comparison to running. It makes total sense, but uh, there's no gliding in running. No, so, there's no glide. <laughs> so, so you've got to get it done with your legs. Here, you you know, there's kind of a, you know, there's kind of an art to this science, and that is you know, how much you can use the push you just took. Right. And now, where where some coaches I think get a little bit bogged down when they're when they're trying to do these types of analyses, is they focus on on speed and speed alone. You know, they just say, okay, what do I need to do to get faster? So they they take examples of you know, well, here's what a fast player should look like. What you got to remember, especially with hockey. Is that hockey is a hockey is a a, a dynamic game. It, there's more to it than just how fast you're going. It's got to be functional speed. So you know, for example, a speed skater. In fact, I've got some speed skater uh, analysis over here. Look at how deep their waist bend is on the speed skating side of things, right? Now, if you were to bend over that far at the waist in hockey, you're not going to be able to stick handle. So it's got to be functional. It's got to be functional posturing. While at the same time maximizing, hopefully, what you're you know what you're gaining on the speed side of things. Right. So right. you know we want to go as fast as possible, but still maintain a posture where we can stick handle, control the puck. You know that's that's our end game with hockey. You got to remember that. You know what what's the end game looking like with hockey? No, no, the end you, game is. And you've got a don't you've got a don't from the speed skaters, but I, there, there's bound to be some do's there because these guys have pretty much optimized the speed speed equation. Absolutely, and you know, and you know, I, I can actually we'll, we'll cross over back and forth between these two clips. But uh, you know, the lower body aspects of the speed skaters, generally speaking, are going to be exactly what you're looking for in hockey. You know, a deep knee bend. In fact, let's take a couple looks at these guys. Deep knee bend. That's the first thing we're looking at, right? Look how nice and low these guys are looking. Right. Um, you want a full extension, or sorry, a, a, a push off to the side. I mean, you can drastically see that here. He's definitely pushing off. Because there's no straight back in speed skating at all. Um, and then the last thing we're looking at is that full extension with a nice toe snap at the end. And this is a, a really good clip showing that. Watch this guy. I'm going to back it up a tiny bit. Watch the, the Canadian fellow here. Um, he's going to be a full extension. And then right here, see, boom, right there. You see that toe snap. So right yeah. there is the full extension. And then he adds that nice little toe snap right there at the end. And that little, you know, extra two or three inches of that toe snap, that's where the explosive speed comes from. You know, you can see if we click back over to Ethan. Ethan's actually a smooth little skater. You know, for nine years old, he's doing a, a pretty nice job. He's a smooth skater, but there's no explosion there. There's no, you know, really just kind of a, a burst of speed there. It's just nice and smooth. And uh, what I would like to see is for him to get deeper knee bend. In fact, let's go back. Let's click over to, uh, we'll go to the front, front view here. What I would like to see here is a deeper knee bend. Um, with a deeper knee bend, he'll be able to get a more full extension. So he'll be able to reach out to the side a lot more. Um, and then, um, you know, the the other thing is his his angle is a little bit off. The angle that he's striding at, he's pushing a little bit too far back. And you'll be able to see that here. You can see he's not really. I optimally, I say about a 45 degree angle. Okay, and, I see it um, there. Yeah. And you can see it even better from the back view. Let me jump over to that. You can see. I mean, you can see his extension is coming back. It's not coming. If it were going at a 45 degree angle, his foot would be more out here. Now, now maybe he was coached. Uh, both of my uh, both of my boys play hockey, 
And it seems to me that we've, you know, had coaching on, on both sides of this, but, you know, some of them suggested shorter, uh, you know, more, more chops and shorter strides. Okay, so, you know, and that, there, there are different, uh, I guess, I don't know if I want to call it a fad, but there are different philosophies that come along from time to time, and people experiment with them and, and you know, make their theories and, and test it out. Right now, one of the common theories that you're seeing is, um, is exactly what you said, you know, take a wider stance. You know, so there's, there's a thing I call railroad skating, and uh, Ethan's actually, he's not doing too bad of a job here. His, his railroad skating is not bad, but when we're talking railroad skating, in fact, I'm going to draw a couple of lines here. So... Uh, Kind of uh, put the rink, the background of the rink, out of your mind, and just try to think about. Imagine we're looking at a skater's, a skater's skate from an overhead view. Okay, so we've okay. got the one skate here. In fact, let me change this color so we can see it a little bit better. Okay. So, so we're looking straight down on his head. Yeah, as if we're in a kind of a bird's eye view of a skater, okay. and we're just talking, we're just talking about skates, pretty much. So this is his, let's say this is his left skate. And this is his right skate, okay? okay. And, he's, and he's facing towards the top of my screen. So it's, it's a, as if we're going to go this way with it, okay? So when we're when we're pushing, I'm going to have some arrows here instead. So let's just say, you know, on his regular angle, we're talking, you know, no, nobody's really debating what angle it should be pushed off at. It's it's about a 45 degree angle. So if you're pushing too far straight back, you're not going to get any grip in the ice. Um, if sure. you're pushing too far to the side, then you're, you're going to be pushing yourself sideways instead of, you know, right, right. right. So we're talking about a 45 degree angle. So we're going to be, you know, assuming the stride's coming this way. So his left foot, he's pushing off about that way. Now, where you come into the different schools of thought is how far back you need to bring your foot after each stride. So what some of these coaches are saying is, hey, it's better off, you know, going back to that speed equation, it's better off to have a less efficient stride and more, you know, higher frequency, you know, more of them. Right. So what they're saying is, uh, you know, come all the way back, you know, about maybe about halfway. So your stride is never really going further back in. So assuming this is completely under your body, right. they're, they're skating down the ice. If we go the other way, this is why I call it railroad skating. So imagine it's kind of the same thing coming off the other side, full extension out, but then they're only bringing it back halfway. And so if you imagine what the new stance looks like, it looks like you're skating with railroad ties in between your, in, in between your feet, right? I'm with you. Make sure I get back, get back to my regular line here. So really you're only coming back about this far in. And so it's as if we're driving, you know, skating with our foot, one on each side of a railroad. I've heard it called different things, but in my mind, railroad skating kind of stands out as a pretty descriptive <laughs> term for it. Right. Um, so, well, you know, you there's know, a well, theory out there. Yeah, well, I, well, I can see, you know, how the theory might get started. I mean, I think you kind of put it to bed with the Olympic skaters there. I mean, you, you certainly don't yeah, see that at all, and that is, you know, their absolute goal is pure speed. That's what I was going to say. So if you look at... You know, look at somebody who's skating for speed and speed alone, right? And how far back are they coming out? I, I, I live out in Salt Lake. They had the 2002 Olympics here. And um, the U.S. Olympic speed skating team actually still practices. Um, they, they still train at the Olympic Oval in, uh, here in Salt Lake. And so that's actually the same rink that my little boy plays his, his, uh, his little league out of. And so I get to – I actually catch quite a bit of their training, you know, while I'm there for his practices or running camps or anything like that. So I've seen this firsthand, and, and just look, you know, if you want to talk speed, then look at the guys that are going the fastest, you know, and that's speed skaters, obviously. They're, I mean, they're built for speed. That's all they train for is speed, right? right? And you can see they're getting a full, I mean, in fact, they're going like a more than a full recoil. They're coming in, look at right here, his yeah, ankles are almost over. touching. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're crossing past the middle point. Right. I mean, yeah, and, it, I, and I guess uh, I guess some of the compromises you have to make, you know, you talked about the, you know, how much they're bent over, but another compromise would be it's, it seems that they're going pretty much side to side. You obviously don't want to have that much movement when you're trying to keep your stick on the ice. That's the other, yep, that's the other part of the equation. So what I'm saying is lower body, you get, you're very safe to mimic a speed skater in, in terms of what their lower body is doing. Upper body is going to be a little bit different. Now speed skaters, like I just said, they're, they're, they're skating for speed and that's it. Now imagine if you're trying to control a puck with your arms swinging this much. You know, I, I usually like to say, um, you know, if you've got one hand on your stick, you should your arm should be going front to back. If you've got two hands on your stick, then you're allowed to go side to side. Um, you know, but if you're in an open race, open ice battle for the puck, right. then you should probably be having one hand on the stick. And the reason why, even if you could go faster with more of a side to side movement, 
um, you've got to think about what's your stick doing when you know when your arms are swinging that far side to side. The blade of your stick is flipping back and forth, flipping over. So it's going to be a lot harder to control a putt. Um, you know, if you've got your stick flipping, the blade of your stick flipping back and forth um, because you know because of your side to side hand motion. Now, you know, so, here is so actually, probably this, again, this, Ethan looks like he's about a 45 degrees coming. There's certainly a lateral movement, but there's also a side to side on his upper body. Yeah, and his upper body, I don't have too many complaints about that. I mean, his, he's keeping his stick pretty under control. The one thing I've, I did notice is that his stick hand is uh, it doesn't swing as much as his other hand does. So he can maybe get a little bit more symmetrical in terms of what we're looking at there. I see. Um, you know, but generally speaking, I don't have too many complaints upper body wise with with Ethan. Main thing with Ethan is he gets a deeper knee bend, pushes a little bit more off to the side, and then focuses on really getting that toe snap at the end. He'll have a much more explosive stride. Right now, he's he's a very smooth skater. It's just not that explosive power, you know, that you see that burst at the end of each stride. Right. So that's that's what we're looking at with Ethan. I I think he's you know he's off to a great start. He's only nine years old, so there's plenty of time to fix it. You know, nine is still young enough that um, you know it's it's not that hard to fix. You know, bad habits or mistakes or anything like that. And well, I'm, I don't I'm know if, he, to see I don't how know if you found this, Jeremy, but you know it seems to me that if you were to ask him what he's doing, you know, he he may feel uh, there's there's a saying in the video analysis world that feel is not real. So you know he may feel that he's doing some of the things that you would suggest that he is doing. You know. Uh, how, how much have you seen the video help them realize and help them sort of take the medicine? Video, there, there's no excuses on video. Um, and and I've, I've, we've kind of talked about this before the show, but um, I, I've worked with all ages. You know, my most recent team that I was coaching was, uh, was a college level. And so, and, and you know, this coming year I'm going to be working with my, my he'll be six years old uh, next month, my, my, my oldest boy, but he's only, he's only five right now, he's going to be six. Um, the older you get, usually the more excuses they're going to give you, the less coachable they're going to be, and in terms of habits, the habits are harder to break. Um, when you're talking younger players, they might not be able to comprehend what you're saying, but as soon as you show them on video, all of a sudden it's like a light bulb goes off. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I bust out chalk, uh, power chalks, you know, at any excuse possible. Um, my, my little five-year-old, he was working on his wrist shot, and he's having some issues with it. And um, you know, I kept trying to explain to him, and I even tried to show him you know, what I wanted it to look like. And he he thought he was doing it, and that's exactly what you said. He thought he was doing it. He felt like he was doing it. Um, but then as soon as I took video of it, and I just I didn't even use anything too sophisticated. I just you know brought out my iPhone, and uh, you know just took a quick video of him taking his wrist shot, and then had him film me taking my wrist shot, and then I did the side by side comparison here on on Power Chop, and all it was like a light bulb went off in his head. He's like, Oh, okay, and you know it, it wasn't an instant fix, but he knew what it looked like, and he knew what right. it should look like, and he was, he he's been working on it ever since, and it's it's gotten a lot better. Yeah, you know, speaking of that, the other thing that we talked about uh, that I saw that you were doing was actually putting game footage up against uh, sort of the theoretical using our diagramming tool to compare and contrast the game footage. So maybe yeah. if you could demonstrate that. So now, I will tell you. This has been maybe one of the most powerful coaching tools um, or ways of using video that uh, you know that I've that I've kind of come across. I mean, we've seen for years and years, you know, uh, you know, football or baseball, you know, hockey, where they're using the telestrating and they're drawing out things that should be happening on the rink. Um, what I started doing is uh, digital chalk talks with my team. Now, you know, we've got especially at the college level, we've got everybody's busy, everybody's got different things going on. And um, you know, with class schedules and everything else, it's sometimes it's tough to get. You know, we already have our practice schedule. Sometimes it's tough to get everybody together. You know, an hour before even, and you know, go through game film or video or or you know, or chalk talk or whatever. So I started doing vi digital chalk talks, which has um, you know really, it's it's cut down the time spent at the rink, and it's almost like a home. It becomes a home study course. For now, now for the, the viewers out there, let me explain what Jeremy's done here in the A slot. So you've got two slots that you can load videos into. But what PowerChalk also has is a diagramming tool. So what Jeremy's done is loaded the diagram with movable pieces and parts into A while he's loaded game footage. Now, now you're illustrating something else that we've seen, Jeremy, and that is that you know once it's game on, the, the footage you had earlier of the, of the stride, you can go down on the ice and you can get very detailed up close and personal video, but it's difficult you know, at game time 
to focus on a single player. So what you typically do with game film is shoot the entire rink, and you know, now what you can do is focus on position and strategy. So, so with that, Absolutely. Uh, you know, what Jeremy's got, coaches, is the theoretical on the left and the, some game footage on the right, and he can just switch back and forth. Yeah, and that's all you do is just toggle back and forth between the two. And so you can say, hey, you know, I asked you to do this, and, um, you know, here's what it should have looked like. And then you click over the game film and say, here's what it actually looked like. Here's where the problem broke down. Or, or in this case, this is going to be actually a really good example of, of you know, there was a, an example of one line that did really well on our one two two foosball floor check. And so what I'll do here is just for you know kind of for the demonstration is show you what the foosball floor check will look like. So, so what um, are we looking at? We got so, we got a five on five here. Yeah, it's five on five situation. I've just kind of we're gonna be the red team in this. I've I've just pulled this all out to the neutral zone. I'll I'll throw these guys in their proper positions as we go. But um, what we're assuming here is let's just say we dumped the puck in and their defenseman has gone in and picked up the puck. There are different types of floor checks obviously and if, if you're listening to this as a hockey coach you'll you'll understand most of this already. But um, in different types of four check, the one two two four check, the one two two, I call it one two two foosball because of the way that, that the play shapes out. And I'll show you kind of what I'm talking about here. But um, basically, what we do is the first man in is going to go in hard and pressure the puck carrying defense. And usually, what we have him do is pressure from outside in. So it's almost like we're going to take away that strong side, force him to either pass behind the net, you know, possible D to D pass to this guy, or you know, oftentimes what ends up happening is if he takes the right angle, this guy just this defenseman just skates it behind the net. So we're going to try to flush him from one side to the other. If, if it doesn't work or if this guy gets beat, it's, it's not a big deal. The main goal of this first man in is going to be just to make it so that he, this defenseman is making a pressured play. So he just wants to make him have to make a pass under pressure. Okay? The second two guys, so let's just call it, um, let's call it a centerman and the winger. They're going to come in. And basically, they're going to, you know, whichever side the puck's on, they're going to kind of line up on the strong side a little bit, but with the intent that as the play shifts from one side to the other, they're also going to shift. And it's going to be the same thing with the defenseman. So the strong side D is going to hold the line. Um, weak side D is over here. And then as this play shifts, what happens is, let's just say the defenseman walks from one side to the other, this forward is going to chase him, okay? And the way that we line up, it makes it look like there's a board side breakout available. But what happens is we, and, and usually in the game, this, this guy will be swinging open, something like that. But what happens, what we do in the game is we have, this is where the foosball comes in. We have um, our new strong side winger slide straight over and makes the hit. So he's trying to time it so that he arrives at that player at the same time, the same time as the puck. Okay. And then our, our second forward will be coming back at a slightly defensive angle. Our defenseman is sliding straight across holding the blue line, but we don't pinch. That's why this is where we're calling foosball. If you think of a foosball table, the guys are going side to side. They're never going up and back, right? So in this particular four check, we call it foosball because it'll break down as soon as, you know, if, if this, let me just jump back over. If this player gets, you know, kind of gets all too wound up and thinks he can go into the corner and make a play, then the play is broken because as soon as that happens, puck moves out to this guy, and now they're flying out of the zone. So we call it foosball because the players, you know, the second, second, and third line of attack, the, the two forwards and the two defensemen, are just coming, pretty much coming straight across. And the weak side guys are coming at a slightly defensive angle, just in case. But basically, we're looking, you know, it's almost like a, it functions similar to a neutral zone trap, but it's just happening in the offensive zone. So this is our, this is what our foosball floor check would look like. Now, when we click over the game, you're going to see some really good examples of how this plays out in an actual game situation. We always draw things up, and we draw them on the board, and they look great. I, I call it the textbook version. Um, but then in games, there's always unforeseen factors, variables that go in, and you're going to have to. There is still going to be an element of read and react on the fly. So that's kind of what we're looking at. So let me click over to the game footage, and um, I'm going to click to uh, right to the, to the beginning of this. And you can see this is uh, um, our team is the blue team. It's, it's, it looks like they're black on this video, but our team is the dark team. And we've got a face off in the offensive zone. So we're, we're going to go ahead. Um, you know what? Let me watch. Let me show you in full speed so you kind of get an idea of what this looks like. And then we'll dissect it and go ahead after that. Okay. So as you can see, face off, we actually lost the face off. Our strong side D held the line but didn't pinch. Okay, and now we're into our foosball formation. So you got the deep man chasing. So you guys slide across, cut it off. And then there's actually a nice switch there. Same thing, cut it off. D holds the line, doesn't pinch, get a shot on net, they go back in the formation after the rebound, 
cut it off on the boards again. Now we've got to cut off the middle. And now here's a nice, nice hit there. And and the plays back in. Now this is our fourth line actually. So this is our in theory our checking line. Probably I hate to call guys the least talented, but these are the guys probably with the least amount of finesse. You know, they're not our goal scoring line. Um, but our fourth line was able to absolutely hem in the other team into their zone um, by using this particular four check. Right. So um, let me go ahead and I'll I'll play a kind of partial speed here. In fact, let's a little bit faster than that. So we can kind of see how this actually, I mean, they did it really, really well. This is about as close to textbook as you would say. But um, the, the cool thing about this is there were some, some good reads and reacts and adjustments made on the fly. So there's the first one. As you can see, we had our strong side defenseman holding the line. And this is where, you know, I use I use quite a bit of the drawing and stuff like that. So we had, uh, you know, our first, I'm going to change it to, to blue on this one. We had our defenseman right here. He held the line. And uh, the other defenseman, it was hard to see, but he actually came backing out of the zone. So it was, a, again, slightly defensive angle. So in case that puck scores through, we're not, you know, left with a 2 on or 1-0. On um, from there, we'll go ahead and let it play. So puck gets dumped in the corner. This player here reads it and realizes he's going to be the pressure man. And so he was trying to get it. didn't actually happen. Bit of a tough angle. Let me see if I can. There we go. Let me get a little bit more view here. Okay, now here's where they go into the, the foosball formation. So we know this guy right here, he's going to be our chase man. Now he reads the play and sees, okay, this guy's far enough ahead of me. I'm not going to chase him behind the net. So he actually does a slight variation and just keeps the pressure on but cuts to the front of the net. Now, as you can see, um, this player slides straight across, makes the play on the board. This defensive side straight across. This guy comes back at a defensive angle. This is exactly like what we drew up on the on the on the whiteboard. And this guy came back at a defensive angle. Now what we want is we want these guys to slide over fast enough so that um, the play on the boards, this guy can arrive at the same time as the puck. We want the other man, you know, hanging out in the middle in case they try to go a middle breakout. And so that's exactly what happens here. And I'm gonna actually leave the arrows on and watch, see how close to the actual diagram these guys stay. Now, this is where we're talking. Like, you don't have to be an extremely talented player um, to really be functional. As long as you understand the system and are capable of reading, and reacting. You know, these guys, um, you know, they're they're good players, but they didn't they didn't score a ton of goals this year. But they, when they did the system, they played so well and they were very effective for us. So you can see how that that you know came came all you know kind of came together and they they played a textbook there. Now here's one of the really cool things that happened. So this guy gets over there in time to make the play. The white player realizes he's not—he doesn't have a passing option. So instead of trying to force a pass up, he takes the puck and tries to skate back down around and see if he can come back out the other side. Now, since our player right here, that was just the, one of the foos men, the foos guys, the foos across, he realized, okay, I'm the closest man now. So now he follows him, becomes the new F1, pressuring this passer, and basically just switches with this player right here. Now this guy realizes the play is about to come back the other way, and just watch how this whole thing materializes. But he comes back across to seal off the board. This guy realizes, you know, they've done a switcheroo, so he's pulling back into the middle, and then the two defensemen come back in, and you know, it's just the same exact thing happening on the other side. Let's go ahead and play it. I might actually get rid of these lines here. Make it a little bit easier to see. Okay, so we have a a textbook switch. Now you can see this guy's pressuring that pass, making sure that pass is going to be happening under pressure. We've got a defenseman that's slid in on the boards. And even though this guy didn't actually get, you know, get get control of that guy before he made the pass, we've got our defenseman. He he pressured it. The guy had no play, so he chips it up the boards, and now it's right back on our defenseman's stick again. Right. Right. Well, you know, Jeremy, this this is great stuff. The you know, you you've, you've illustrated another point, and that is that this can not only be used to show, to show a player what he might improve, this has got to be a great thing for these kids to say, you did it exactly the way we drew it up. You know, here it is yeah. theoretically, and here are you guys executing. And, you know, I, I've found in my coaching career that attaboys you know, are just as strong you know, as criticisms. 
So the, yeah, there's, and you know, there's a real incentive here to, to get it right and to do it right and to be told you know, that, that you did it perfectly. Yeah, and, and you know, I mean, I, I – I, I, I probably, you know, my general tendency, I, I like to point out the things that could be improved on, <laughs> you know. Um, I could probably do a little bit better on the attaboy side of things, uh, you know, but this one was just so good and so so perfectly executed that it was it was really hard not to, you know, point this out. And we, you know, during the season, I, I definitely pointed this one out to the players, and it's, 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 it's a very good example of how it needs to be done. What is it? It's a great example of how, how to use power chalk as well. Uh, at this point, coaches, I've got to say that's our 30 minutes. We're right up against the time here. Uh, this, this was great for me. Like I said, it, it really brings in a whole new element you know, how, of how this is used in a different sport. Uh, Jeremy, thank you for showing us this. Thanks for spending time. Uh, coaches, I'm going to take the screen back over and remind you that you can see more from Jeremy and actually work with Jeremy by going to weisstechhockey.com slash blog. And you can view this session, which we've recorded and will post immediately after at youtube.com slash powerchalk. Jeremy, thanks again. Uh, look yeah, forward thanks, to doing thanks for this. We'll, we'll, we'll pull up some more video and, and keep talking hockey. Uh, thanks again for your time. Yeah, absolutely. It was, a, it was a blast. Thanks for tuning in, coaches.